We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that you really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodjevix. Joining me today is Richard Duncan, author of three books, Macro Economist, and the founder of the video newsletter, Macro Watch. Thanks for joining me today, Richard. Tom, thank you. It's, it's nice to be on. Great to have you. And I'm looking forward to this discussion. It's been a little, little while in the making, so it's great to finally be able to speak with you. So you published a video earlier this summer entitled Credit, Economic Growth, and Inflation to Slow. So how does credit growth affect all of these different factors? Okay, so I really believe it's the most important thing to understand about macroeconomics in the 21st century is that credit growth drives economic growth. It didn't used to always be like that, but that's the way it is now. And what I mean by credit is total credit. So for the US, for instance, total credit is equal to total debt. One person's credit is another person's debt. One asset is another person's liability. So the easiest way to measure this is to look at all the debt of the country, government debt, household sector debt, corporate debt, financial sector debt, all the debt, which by the way, has now climbed to $85 trillion. It first went through $1 trillion in 1960. By the crisis of 2008, it had multiplied 50 times up to more than 50 trillion. And now it's 85 trillion. So what I have seen is that looking back to 1950, any time total credit in the US, and this is adjusted for inflation to compare apples with apples, any time total credit in the US grows by less than 2%, mm -hmm. the US has gone into a recession. And that happened nine times between 1950 and 2009. And every time the US went into recession and the economy didn't recover until there was another big surge of credit growth. So it's very important to monitor and forecast credit growth because if credit doesn't grow by 2% adjusted for inflation, we're likely to go into recession and the policymakers are going to have to respond to that. So it seems that there has been a market change in the functioning of the economy. When does that change really start to take place? Does that change really start with coming off of the gold standard over 50 years ago? Right. I think one of the biggest problems people have in understanding how the economy works today is that they're still assuming that it works the way it did back in the 19th century when all of the classical economic textbooks were written. But it has fundamentally changed because Back in the 19th century, the cornerstone of all of that economic theory was the assumption that gold was money. And everything they wrote after that was built on that cornerstone. But gold hasn't been money now for 50 years. And once the United States stopped backing dollars with gold around 50 years ago, the nature of our economic system started to evolve in very important ways that has dramatically altered the way the economy works today relative to the way that it worked in the past. So let me explain. So the big change really came in 1968. Up until then, the Fed was required to hold gold, or more precisely, gold certificates, to back the dollars that it created. And so there was a limit as to how many dollars they could create because the Fed only had a certain amount of gold. In fact, by 1968, the Fed no longer had enough gold to continue issuing any more dollars. So that's when Congress changed the law and they eliminated the requirement for the Fed to hold any dollars at all to back the money that it created. And then, so that was really the end of gold-backed money. But you could say the nail in the coffin was when President Nixon ended the right of other countries to convert their dollars into U.S. gold in 1971 when he closed the gold window. So you could say sometime between 1968 and 1971, that's when the U.S. stopped backing dollars with gold. And suddenly things started to change. Of course, first of all, the Fed was free to create as much money as it pleased after that, whereas there were strict limits on how much money it could create before then. So what we've seen, for instance, just in the last couple of years since the COVID pandemic began, the Fed has created something approaching four and a half trillion dollars and 
less than two years. Of course, that would have been inconceivable, entirely impossible if the Fed had been required to hold gold. The gold reserves are valued at something like $11 billion. So that was the first fundamental change. The Fed was free to create as much money as it desired. The only constraint there was the fear that creating a lot of money would lead to high rates of inflation, which the Fed didn't want to do. That brings us to the second fundamental change. In the past, let's say up until this breakdown of the Bretton Woods system, trade between countries had to balance. Because if one country had a large trade deficit with another country, it would have to pay for that deficit by sending its gold to the other country. And therefore, its gold reserves would shrink. Therefore, its money supply would shrink. And consequently, its economy would go into severe recession. And pretty soon, unemployment would go up. And the country with the big trade deficit, they would have a big recession. And they would stop buying so many things from other countries. And on the other hand, the country with the trade surplus, that country would receive more gold. And so their economy would boom as credit expanded on the back of the increased gold base. And they would soon have inflation, but they would begin buying more from the country with the trade deficit. So let me give you an example. Say in the 19th century, if England had a big trade deficit with France, England would have had to put its gold on a ship and send it over to France. So the money supply would have contracted in England. They would have had a big recession. Unemployment would have gone up. And there would have been deflation as the money supply contracted. The opposite would have happened in France. France would have had more gold in the banks, so the banks could extend more credit on the back of that gold. France's economy would have boomed. That would have led to full employment and high rates of inflation. And pretty soon, the rich French would start buying more cheap English goods, and the poor unemployed English would stop buying so many expensive French goods, and trade would come back into balance. So there was an automatic adjustment mechanism under the gold standard and under the Bretton Woods system that ensure that trade between countries balanced. So if you look at the US trade deficit, it was in balance really up until the time Bretton Woods broke down in 1971. And then it remained in balance really until the early 1980s. But by the 1980s, the US government discovered that it could start running very large trade deficits and it didn't have to pay with gold anymore. It could just pay with paper dollars or government bonds denominated in paper dollars. And there was no longer any limit as to how many of those that it could create. So the trade deficit, the current account balance went from being in balance in 1980 to being about three and a half percent of US GDP by the middle of the 80s. And this was entirely unprecedented. This huge by past standards uh, trade deficit was very alarming to global policymakers around the world And so they met at the Plaza Hotel in New York and reached the Plaza Accord. And that deal was that the dollar would be devalued by 50% against the yen and the mark over the next couple of years. And that occurred. And as a result, the US trade came back into balance in the late 80s. But then in 1990, China really entered the global economy, along with the other developing economies, the tigers and the dragons of Asia. And the U.S. trade deficit started becoming very, very much larger again. And by 2006, the trade deficit had blown out to 6% of GDP. That was $800 billion in that one year alone. Now, the significance of this is that once the U.S. started running these big trade deficits with the rest of the world, it no longer had to depend on the production capacity and the size of the U.S. labor force because it could buy things from the entire world. Before then, if the US government ran very large budget deficits, or if the Fed created too much money to stimulate the economy, then the US economy would reach full capacity. Everyone would be fully employed, and all of the companies, all of the factories would be working at full capacity. So too much government stimulus would lead to an economic boom, and that boom would run up against domestic capacity constraints in the United States, And that would lead to high rates of inflation. And that was undesirable. But once we started running these very large trade deficits, increasingly with ultra low wage countries, we no longer had to worry about the domestic bottlenecks inside the US economy, because suddenly we could buy things from everywhere in the world and goods made with ultra low cost labor. 
So now the global population is about 23 times larger than the U.S. population. And there is tremendous excess industrial capacity around the world, particularly in China. So by this second change that followed the break in the link between dollars and gold, the second change was suddenly we had a global economy and a global economy full of people willing to work for less than $10 a day and with tremendous excess capacity of industrial capacity. So globalization became extremely disinflationary. And so, for instance, in the 1960s and early 70s, the government spent too much money on the Vietnam War and on the Great Society programs, and that overheated the economy. And that led to high rates of inflation in the, in the late 60s and, and 70s, and requiring Paul Volcker then to increase the federal funds rate to a very high level and to provoke a very serious recession in the U.S. in the early 80s. But then President Reagan came along. He was elected in 1980, and his budget deficits were far larger than anything that we had seen under Kennedy or Johnson or even Nixon. But this time in the 80s, these very large budget deficits of President Reagan, they didn't lead to high rates of inflation in the, in the 1980s. Something had changed. What had changed is the U.S. was running enormous trade deficits by that point. And so what we've seen in the decades since then is really regardless of how large the budget deficit becomes. And more recently, we've seen, for that matter, regardless of how much money the Fed creates, we still have had very low rates of inflation up until very recently. And in fact, even now, the inflation rates, although that's all anyone is talking about, but the inflation is really very low relative to what you would expect, given that the government has increased its debt by five or six trillion dollars over the last two years, and the Fed has created four and a half trillion dollars of new money. You would have expected something like that to lead to hyperinflation, mm -hmm. but that's not what we're seeing. I mean, what we're seeing is so the CPI, the headline number, is up most recently in October, six point two percent. But if you look at where it was compared with two years ago, it's up 7.5% compared with October 2019. So the two-year average is 3.8%. And the Fed's favorite measure of inflation is core PCE inflation. It's up 4.1% over one year, but the two-year average is just 2.8%. So this by no means should be considered extremely high rates of inflation. And looking ahead, it looks as though the economy is going to slow before long. And consequently, it seems very likely that the inflationary pressures will also abate before long. Richard, when we think about the core PCE or the CPI numbers, is a big part of what we're seeing at this point in time, what is called the base effect or the comparison to last year when the economy was just starting to deal with all of the effects of the lockdown? Yes, some of that is true. But we also have to look at not just the year-on-year -year comparisons, mm -hmm. which would reflect the base effect, but also it's important to look at the month-on-month -month change in the inflation numbers. And what we saw is that there was quite a big jump in inflation during the second quarter. But during the third quarter, the inflation rate on a month-on-month -month basis was just about half as much as it was during the second quarter. Now, part of that was because of the resurgence of COVID in the, in the U.S., and of course, people were more reluctant to go out and spend. No doubt that had some impact. And in fact, once the last wave died down, we did see another significant pickup in the month-on-month -month number of inflation in October. So we do have to look at the month-on-month -month change. And it is elevated. It's not just a base effect. Mm -hmm. Although, as I mentioned earlier, if you look at the two-year average of inflation, and that does incorporate, you know, it is true that the inflation is higher this year, in part because there was deflation last year. You can't ignore that. You shouldn't <laughs> ignore that. So looking ahead, though, the picture is very cloudy. We have to look back. So what has caused the higher prices? Well, there was a lot of government stimulus. Mm -hmm. First, there was the CARES Act. That was $2 trillion in March of 2020. And then another $900 billion in December 2020 of stimulus. And then most recently, another $2 trillion in, in March 2021. But now there's not going to be any more big stimulus bills like those. 
those certainly propped up people's ability to spend. Without those stimulus packages and without the monetary support that the Fed supplied, then it's very likely the U.S. would have collapsed into a new Great Depression and drug the world down with it. And then in that scenario, we would have had very high rates of deflation. During the Great Depression, prices fell 45%. So it is certainly true that this stimulus provided the spending power that prevented massive deflation and a depression and has resulted in prices moving higher. But now that's going to fade. That's already fading. The last big dose of that was back in March 2021. There aren't going to be any more big fiscal stimulus packages unless a new disaster strikes. And meanwhile, on the monetary side, the stimulus was also extraordinary. If we look at the period from the time COVID really began affecting the U.S. economy in February 2020 up until June of this year, the U.S. government debt increased by $5 trillion, and the Fed created $4 trillion to help finance those big budget deficits at low interest rates. So that was just fiscal and monetary stimulus on a scale we've really never seen, uh, certainly not in peacetime. But now the fiscal stimulus is over, and the monetary stimulus is about to be faded out. Tapering has already begun. And the news this morning was that Chairman Powell is now signaling that they're going to accelerate the pace of tapering. So up until this morning, it was expected that tapering would carry on and not finish until June. But now it looks like it could finish as soon as March with interest rate hikes to follow that. So the monetary stimulus is also going to fade out. And the thing that I watch most closely is the total credit growth of the country. Mm -hmm. So with the budget deficits in 2020, the budget deficit was more than $3 trillion. In 2021, the fiscal year in September 30th, it was just under $3 trillion. Well, for 2022, it's only expected to be around $1.1 trillion. So the government's going to be borrowing much less, and therefore credit growth is going to slow very rapidly. And as credit growth slows, that's going to act as a big drag on the economy because credit growth is the main driver of economic growth. And in fact, it looks like we could be under the 2% recession threshold within the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. And just to reiterate what you said earlier is that 2% threshold really ends up leading to recession very often. But do we also have to account for the inflation rate when we take into consideration this 2% growth per year in the credit or the debt growth? Yes, I mean, we do. And frankly, we have to be very humble about any sort of economic forecasting models we try to put together. Mm -hmm. These should be viewed as indicative and not something written in stone. For instance, we're experiencing such an extraordinary, unprecedented moment now where the government has injected such a huge amount of fiscal stimulus into the economy that people's savings rate, the savings is higher, much higher than it was before the stimulus checks went out. And so maybe the debt that was taken on by the government over the last year and a half, you know, maybe that's going to linger and continue to boost the economy longer than would normally be expected, given that credit growth will appear significantly weaker this year and next year, particularly because the inflation rate is going to be higher this year and next year. So these are extraordinary circumstances. You know, I, I don't think you can say with absolute certainty just because we come in below the 2% recession threshold that we're definitely going to have a recession next year. Mm -hmm. But it does show us the direction in which we're moving. Sooner or later, the stimulus checks that went into people's bank accounts, that money is going to be spent. And we will then revert to a more normal pattern where we need credit growth to make the economy grow. So what does that number end up needing to be once we adjust for inflation, just to try and conceptualize how much that credit growth needs to be next year? Well, okay. So the credit base now is $85 trillion. If we assume a normal inflation rate of 2%, it won't be 2% next year. It will be higher probably next year. It's certainly higher at the moment. But that would mean we need 2% credit growth plus another 2% for inflation. 
because we're adjusting for inflation. So we need 4% growth on $85 trillion. Mm -hmm. So that's $3.4 trillion a year based on the current base. And that's just to prevent us from having a recession. So who is going to borrow $3.4 trillion over the next 12 months? Well, we know the government's probably going to borrow. The Congressional Budget Office says $1.1 trillion. It could be higher than that with the infrastructure spending, but that's probably not going to kick in immediately. There's a new social spending bill that's probably going to be passed. So I don't know, maybe the government could borrow as much as $1.5 trillion, but that still leaves practically another $2 trillion. Who's going to borrow another $2 trillion? Is it our households, our corporations? Normally, they don't borrow that much. And if we start to see interest rates go up, that's going to deter borrowing. So we've gotten to the point where, you know, I like to say that our economic system, once dollars cease to be backed by gold, it evolved from capitalism into creditism. And so capitalism was an economic system where it was driven like this. Here was the growth dynamic. Businessmen would invest. Some of them would make a profit. They would save that profit, or in other words, accumulate capital, hence capitalism, and repeat. They would invest and save and invest and save. So it was investment and savings that was the growth dynamic that created economic growth under capitalism. But our system has evolved into something different now. It doesn't work like that anymore. Our system is now driven by credit growth and consumption and more credit growth and more consumption. That's the dynamic that drives our economy now that capitalism has evolved into creditism. It's credit growth that drives economic growth. And we've gotten to the point where there's so much debt in the private sector that it's very difficult to keep private sector debt growing rapidly enough to drive the economy. And that's why the government sector has been forced to take on more and more debt Mm -hmm. particularly since the crisis of 2008. In the years running up to 2008, the household sector was taking on an extra trillion dollars of debt every year during that bubble that led to the property bubble and, and the 2008 crisis. But afterwards, the government has had to take the lead. And it's been government debt that's been growing and making the economy grow. And, and in fact, keeping the economy out of collapsing into a depression twice now since 2008. So, Richard, when we think about what the effects of the pandemic have been, what sectors of that credit market are really growing? I know that we saw a real explosion in corporate debt at the beginning for companies trying to you know, stay afloat and get ahead of maybe others in line that were wanting to get other loans. So talk to us a little bit about how that debt picture has really been changed since COVID. Yes. So even before COVID, the corporate debt was growing quite rapidly. And then when COVID hit, all the corporations immediately tried to borrow as much money as they possibly could because they could see disaster looming in terms of their likely cash flows going forward. And they were afraid if they didn't have enough cash, they would go out of business. Luckily for them, the government sent out checks to individuals and made loans to businesses so the individuals could keep buying and the corporations could avoid bankruptcy. But they loaded up on a lot of cash in the second quarter of last year. But in more recent quarters, they have been borrowing. The growth in borrowing has been much less because they already have a lot of cash. So there's been a slowdown there. We're seeing some pickup in household borrowing for mortgages and also some pickup in borrowing by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the government-sponsored enterprises. But projecting these things out, there are only really five big sectors of the economy in terms of what we have to look at in terms of who can borrow the money. Mm -hmm. It's the government, it's the household sector, it's the corporate sector, and then what is called the non-corporate business sector, and then the financial sector. That's it. So if you can project out, make educated guesses about how much each of these sectors will borrow in the next couple of years... And of course, there are guesses, but you know they're going to be within a relatively small range. So they're fairly easy to make pretty accurate guesses. If you project these things out, you can see it's going to be difficult for the economy to grow its debt level by 2% adjusting for inflation, unless it's the government that continues to take the lead and to take on more government debt. Because while the private sector is constrained in how much it can borrow, 
is constrained by its income, household income, and of course, corporate cash flow. The government sector is not constrained. The government, there are essentially no limits as to how much money the US government can borrow, particularly as long as the Fed is willing to create money to finance that borrowing. So Richard, is part of the problem that you're just highlighting there with the personal debt, is part of that problem the fault of the banks that have tightened their lending standards, even though there's more cash on their balance sheets than ever? So these sorts of big macro trends evolve over long periods of time and have many different sources and causes. This problem really originated going back 20 years when the financial sector pump so much money into allowing individuals to borrow mortgages. As I mentioned, in the several years leading up to 2008, the household sector was taking on a trillion dollars a year of additional debt. And by 2008, they had just really hit the limit. I think uh, total household sector debt was up to $14 trillion in 2008. And the households were just simply did not have enough income to even service the interest on that debt. And that, when they started defaulting, that is when the 2008 crisis happened. So the household sector has been too heavily indebted since at least then. And unless wages go up a lot, then it's hard for the household sector to take on more debt. Now, so I mentioned that every time total credit grows by less than 2%, between 1950 and 2009, the US went into recession. So what happened after 2009? Well, after 2009, total credit growth was much weaker than it had been in the previous couple of decades. In fact, it was negative in 2009 and 2010. And then because of the increase in government debt, it did eventually expand back to 2% and even almost as high as 3%, but never went anywhere back near close to the levels that we saw before 2008. So the credit growth was too weak to drive economic growth. And after 2008, we've seen anemic economic growth in the US. In fact, credit growth was so inadequate that it forced the Fed to adopt a new policy, really, of pushing up asset prices. The Fed, through a combination of extremely low interest rates and round after round of quantitative easing, ensured that the stock market kept going higher and property prices kept going higher. And this created a wealth effect that supplemented credit growth. Credit growth was too weak to grow the economy after 2008. So the Fed engineered asset price inflation and the asset price inflation created wealth and the wealth provided funds for consumption and the consumption boosted business profits and allowed more investment. So the Fed had to resort to asset price inflation to make the economy keep growing after 2008. So the Fed to a very large extent became a hostage of the S&P Anytime the S&P, anytime the stock prices started to take a significant tumble, it forced the Fed to backtrack and launch either a new round of quantitative easing or announce that it was going to start cutting interest rates or something to that effect. And that's so creditism was really on government life support even before this pandemic started. Remember that even before the pandemic, the U.S. budget deficit had grown back to above $1 trillion in 2019. And the Fed had relaunched quantitative easing starting in September 2019 at the rate of $60 billion a month. That was before the pandemic. So creditism encountered COVID at a time when it was already weak and on government life support. So Richard, I'd like to talk a little bit about interest rates. What role do they really play here? And is the Fed actually able to raise interest rates or are they you know, really trapped between a rock and a hard place here? I think they're trapped between a rock and a hard place, especially now with this new round of this new COVID variant that's popped up over the last week, which could potentially, I mean, really, who knows, but it has the potential to slow the economy significantly. We're already seeing, for example, Japan has banned all foreign visitors into the country. And before this variant popped up, there were new lockdowns in Europe, in Austria, in parts of Germany, because of the pickup due to the Delta variant. So the COVID, of course, is a very big wild card. We can't 
be at all certain how this is going to play out. But it does look like it could act as a real drag on the economy going forward. We've seen just over the last few days, oil prices have plunged and other commodity prices as well. So, you know, you spoke earlier about the wealth effect or the gain in asset value since basically 2008. Can you tell us a bit more about how dramatically asset prices have grown versus, for example, income levels in the U.S.? Yes, so there's one very important gauge that I look at, and it is what I call the wealth to income ratio. And what it is, it's household sector wealth divided by disposable personal income. Wealth takes all of the assets of the American household sector and subtracts all of their liabilities. So that's household sector net worth. Disposable personal income is just exactly that, income. So it is a wealth to income ratio. And the Fed publishes this data at least once every quarter. And it goes back to probably 1945. But from 1950, and this is off the top of my head, but it was roughly this wealth to income ratio since 1950 has averaged 550%. But during the NASDAQ bubble, it went up to something like 610%, which was high. And then that bubble popped and it went back to its normal range of something like 550%. Then during the property bubble of 2007 and eight, this wealth to income ratio went up to something like 670%. And then that bubble popped and the ratio moved back down toward 550. Well, now because of the massive stimulus provided by the government during the COVID pandemic and all of the money created by the Fed, this ratio is now just completely off the charts. It's something like 725%, far higher than it was in 2008 or ever before. Mm -hmm. So that is telling us that wealth has very stretched relative to income. The wealth has gone up a lot. Since 2008, household sector net worth has more or less doubled because of the, all of the stimulus from the government. But income, of course, is not doubled. One of the biggest negative consequences of globalization is that it puts downward pressure on U.S. wages. And so wages have not moved up. And so the reason this is significant is people need to have enough income to pay interest payments on the money they borrow to buy a home. So if home prices shoot up very rapidly, then if income doesn't also move up, you hit a point where the home prices become so expensive that the interest payments on the debt become too great for the households to be able to afford. And that's why there's a limit as to how high this wealth to income ratio can go before it corrects. Mm -hmm. So now we're at this all time high point in this wealth to income ratio, which makes the stock market very vulnerable to any sort of unpleasant thing that happens. And of course, at the moment, we're seeing lots of unpleasant things. This new COVID variant, plus the Fed has already started tapering. We hear this morning that the Fed's going to accelerate tapering and potentially start increasing the federal funds rate sometime before long. So it does make the stock market look very vulnerable at this point. And particularly, you asked earlier if the Fed can hike interest rates. Well, yes, it can to try to control inflation. This statement from Jerome Powell was very interesting because he did really seem to signal that the Fed is now more concerned about inflation than it has been. So it's not certain what they are seeing that they did not see before, but they must have seen something for him to make this pivot and more hawkish pivot about inflation. So what can they do? We know that a lot of the inflationary pressures, some of it is coming from the stimulus that the government has provided, but a great deal of it, the most of it, in my opinion, is coming from the supply bottlenecks. Now, everyone has mentioned the fact that because of the semiconductor shortage, there's a shortage of new cars. So used car prices moved up 40%. And that accounted for a third of all of the inflation in the second quarter, for instance. Uh, those are eventually going to be resolved. We hope soon. I mean, they could be disrupted again if COVID intensifies again. But if we assume that that doesn't happen and we return to a more normal economy, then all of these inflationary bottlenecks are going to be overcome. And then... When that happens, the inflation rate will come back down again. 
particularly since the fiscal stimulus is over and the monetary stimulus is ending. So what can the Fed do now? Okay, the Fed could reduce inflation by hiking interest rates to a very high level and throwing millions of Americans out of work. That's how the Fed can cool off inflation. That's what Paul Volcker did. Paul Volcker in 1980 hiked the federal funds rate into the double digits. Millions of Americans were thrown out of work. It was a very severe recession and inflation came down. Well, you know, that's not the ideal path forward for the country. That also seems to be against, you know, part of the second half of their dual mandate as well, right? Well, precisely. So their dual mandate is always in conflict with the two parts are always in conflict with each other. And given that it is likely that these supply bottlenecks are going to be resolved before very long, not only in manufactured goods, but probably in many of the commodities as well. Commodities are always wildly volatile. They go up radically one year and then they come down radically the next year. That's what you know, commodity prices were very high in 2008. In 2009, there was deflation in commodity prices. They were high again in 2011 and 2012, and within a year, they were down again. So after the very aggressive policy response to the 2008 crisis, the highest rate of inflation at the CPI level we saw was in 2011. And I think the CPI was up 3.8% at the peak in 2011. Well, by 2015, the US had deflation again. The inflation rate was negative in the early months of 2015. So, you know, inflation is always transitory. <laughs> Sooner or later, the mm -hmm. prices do come down. Mm -hmm. And that's, we don't know how soon that's going to be because we don't know how long COVID is going to last. I think a year ago, everyone had assumed reasonably that it would have been over by now, but it's not. And we don't know what's going to happen next. But the ideal policy path forward, in my opinion, and I'm sure the Fed is also worried about this, they don't want to hike up interest rates and cause the stock market to crash and throw millions of Americans out of work just to reduce demand, when even lower demand may not bring down inflation very substantially because we still have shortages of semiconductors and other things. So they are really between a rock and a hard place. Hopefully they will just talk the talk and that will scare the markets and scare people speculating in commodity prices and the prices will come back down without the Fed having to force a recession by throwing millions of Americans out of work. So Richard, how does all of this end? I know that you know we've hit on a couple of times that that 2% credit growth, and if that's not met, then we're very likely to see a recession coming after that. So do we get a, a big, you know, long drawn out recession coupled with some kind of like very spectacular deleveraging event? But how do you see that possibly playing out? So let's take the long view. Let's go back to the Great Depression. So in my opinion, the origins of the Great Depression were resulting from World War I. World War I started in 1914. All of the European nations went to war with each other, most of them. They didn't have enough gold to fight the war. So they all went off the gold standard and they all started creating a lot of fiat money to finance the war and spending a lot of money to finance the war. And the US didn't enter the war until 1917. And in the meantime, the US sold enormous amounts of war materials to the European belligerents. And so the US received extraordinary amounts of gold inflows into the country between 1914 and 1917. And this gold supply, the surge in US gold, that allowed the banks to radically expand credit during the 1920s. During the 1920s, that's when the consumer credit first became really widely available, not only in terms of home mortgages, but for borrowing to finance cars and consumer credit of all kinds. So we got the roaring 20s, as a result, a direct result of the breakdown of the gold standard in World War I. But then in 1930, we reached the point where that bubble started to pop because the consumers, the households, no longer had enough income to service the interest on all of their debt. And the banks started to fail. There were three big rounds of bank failures between 1930 and 1933. And at that time, the policymakers really didn't know what to do. They believed in capitalism and laissez-faire, and they 
more or less stepped back and didn't do very much. And as a result, the banks failed. And as the banks failed, credit started to contract. Credit, credit contracted by roughly a third between 1929 and 1933. And that credit contraction was a thing that caused the Great Depression. And the Great Depression lasted for a decade, and it didn't end until World War II started. And at that point, the U.S. government expenditure skyrocketed beyond anything ever imagined before. And all of the government spending during World War II, which was financed in large part by money creation by the Fed, that ended the Great Depression. Finally, the massive fiscal stimulus from the war ended the Great Depression. But of course, the war killed 60 million people. So policymakers in our lifetime have learned from that mistake. Ben Bernanke was very clear. He admitted that the Fed could have prevented the Great Depression if it had just pumped enough money into the economy to prevent the banks from failing in 1930. And that's what he did in 2008. And so we didn't have a Great Depression in 2008 because credit wasn't allowed to contract. Without the government trillion dollar budget deficits for four years after 2008, financed by three and a half trillion dollars of money creation by the Fed, without that, we would have had a new Great Depression. But the, they had learned the policy mistakes from, the 19, from 1930 and they prevented it. They reflated the bubble and kept the, in fact, kept the bubble inflating. And they did exactly the same thing when the pandemic struck. Rather than everyone being locked down with no income, defaulting on their home loans, and businesses unable to repay their bank credit, leading to a systemic financial sector collapse, none of that happened because the government sent out checks to the Americans and loans to the businesses. And the Fed financed it with $4 trillion of money creation. And so that kept the bubble inflated. It, it prevented credit deflation and it prevented a Great Depression. So what's next? Well, I think unless there's a policy mistake, what's next is more of the same. The government's going to have to keep having large government budget deficits and borrowing and spending to keep the economy growing. How long can that go on? Well, here, I think it's useful to look at Japan. Japan's economic crisis started in 1990. At that time, Japanese government debt was about 65% of GDP. Now, it's because of large budget deficits year after year, Japan has never collapsed into a depression. And the government now has something like 265% government debt to GDP. That's more than twice as much as US government debt to GDP. And what have been the negative consequences in Japan? Well, interest rates, the government can borrow money for 0% for 10 years. And the inflation rate, there hasn't been hyperinflation. Inflation is very close to 0% as well. And the Bank of Japan, the central bank there, they have financed much of this increase in government debt. The Bank of Japan's total assets relative to the size of the GDP, the Bank of Japan's assets as a percent of Japan's GDP is something like 135%. The Fed's assets relative to US GDP, just 35%. So what the experience of Japan is telling us is that the U.S. government can continue borrowing trillions of dollars for many, many, many years into the future with the Fed financing substantial parts of that as need be to prevent interest rates from shooting higher before this game is up. So we can easily carry on with this uh, for another, I mean, since 2008, it's already been 13 years. I don't see why it can't go on for another 13 years or another 20 years or another 30 years. We don't know where the limit is. So what does the road ahead look like for the dollar when QE ends? So as QE seems to be ending rapidly now with the Fed tapering and about to accelerate tapering. And QE is not ending in Europe. In Japan, it bounces around a bit. There's less QE than there was. But it suggests that the dollar is going to become stronger as if the Fed creates less money, the dollar should strengthen, particularly if it becomes increasingly likely that the Fed is going to hike the federal funds rate. If the Fed starts talking seriously about hiking the federal funds rate, 
before Europe does and before Japan does. Japan seems unlikely to ever, it's hard to imagine when Japan will hike their interest rates again. So if the Fed starts hiking, the dollar should strengthen. And of course, if the dollar strengthens, that's bad for commodity prices and bad for gold. So in your view, we're very likely to see a softer or even far worse gold price in the future here? I mean, I regret to say so, but yes, either way you look at it, things don't look very good for gold. On the one hand, if inflation does worsen, which I really don't believe it will, but I could be wrong. If it worsens, then the Fed is going to start hiking interest rates. And if the Fed hikes interest rates, then of course the opportunity cost of holding gold increases because gold doesn't pay any interest. Whereas if your bank account will pay more interest, so money will come out of gold and go into bank accounts or bonds that pay higher interest. So gold would fall under that scenario. On the other hand, an even worse scenario for gold would be if inflation starts to fall, which I believe it will before very long. And once inflation starts to fall, we saw what happened, was it back in 2011, 2012, gold peaked at above 1900 and then fell 40 something percent. That's the sort of scenario that we might unfortunately live through again if once we start to see inflation coming down. Well, Richard, I do appreciate your honesty there, even if it's not exactly what we want to hear. But what will be the best assets to own in that coming recession or that scenario as you're laying out? Is it equities? Well, let me say that I own some gold and I never intend to sell it. I think everybody should own some gold just as a precautionary measure. You never know when you might need to get out of town fast and take your gold coins with you. But in terms of putting millions and millions of dollars in gold, for me, I, I don't do that. I would not recommend doing that because again, gold has no income related to it. Personally, I would prefer buying pieces of land with houses on top that I can rent out because the land is as good as gold. They're both scarce. And if the price of gold goes up, the price of land will go up for the same reason. And meanwhile, you have a house on top and you can rent it out and generate income from that house. And if things really become bad, you can grow vegetables in your, on your land. So just as terms of you know, very large allocations of money, I would prefer owning land with houses on top as rental property. I'm not saying buy condos. There is no limit as to how many condos can be built in the sky, but there is a limit as to how much land there is on the planet. And so land tends to move in the same way that gold does. Excellent, Richard. I think that's a pretty good place to kind of tie things up. There's many more subjects I'd like to get through with you one day. You know, you have some interesting views on China, as I know you've lived in Asia for most of your life here. You also have a section on your website of book recommendations. So could you share with us a couple books, maybe that you find some that you find timeless and, and maybe some that you have found recently that you thought were very interesting and taught you something? Okay, so yes, on my website, it's richardduncaneconomics.com, richardduncaneconomics.com. And there's a tab there, books I recommend. I have books listed separately under economics, history, biographies, autobiographies, philosophy, and science. Uh, I, I love to read, and I've listed the books there that I, I think are the greatest books that I've, I've ever come across, uh, old books and, and new books. One, for example, I think the book that turned me into an economist was called Theories of Economic Growth from David Hume to the Present by W.W. W. Rostow. That's a sweeping survey of all of the theories of economic growth over the last hundred, several hundred years. And you can see how those theories evolved because economic theories, you know, the good ones are appropriate for the time when they're created. But as times change, they become no longer appropriate. They can no longer explain what's going on in the economy around you. For instance, in 1912 and before, in the times when Ludwig von Mises wrote his theories, they were appropriate for that time. Gold was money. There were limits as to how much credit could be created. And so what he wrote was appropriate for the time. 
Later on, Milton Friedman's theories about money supply growth. He used to always say inflation is everywhere and always a monetary phenomenon. Well, that was true in the 1960s when trade between countries had to balance. But those theories, as valid as they were at the time they were created, are no longer valid today. We have a different kind of economic system that I like to call creditism, and it works differently now. So it's necessary for economic theories to evolve as the circumstances that exist evolve. And so the theories have to keep evolving. But if you understand how the theories have evolved over the last several hundred years, then it will help you perhaps understand how they will need to evolve going forward. So that was one really great book, I think. And then I like to read history because I think you can't really understand the global economy without understanding the historical context. And there was one book that I really loved by Peter Watson called Modern Times, The People and Ideas That Shaped the 20th Century. So there are just two, but there are lots of great books under biographies and autobiographies about economists and, and non-economists. I love to read. I've spent the COVID year and a half reading all of Winston Churchill's five volumes on World War I and six volumes on World War II. Wow. That, that took a long, long time, but he wrote beautifully and it was fascinating. That was a big distraction from my work on macroeconomics and prospects for asset prices. Mm -hmm. I bet. That must have been quite an interesting deep dive. The good news is our side won. <laughs> <laughs> well, Richard, of course, like you said, you're available. More information from you and MacroWatch is available at richardduncaneconomics.com and also your Twitter handle at Paper Money Econ. Richard, is there anything else you'd like to share with us before we wrap up? Yes, please. Could I just mention what MacroWatch is? MacroWatch is a video newsletter. Every couple of weeks, I upload a new video discussing something happening in the global economy that's important and how that's likely to impact asset prices going forward, stocks, bonds, commodities, currencies. And so if anyone is interested in subscribing to MacroWatch, I'd like to offer them a 50% discount if they visit the website, richardduncaneconomics.com, hit the subscribe button. They'll be prompted to put in a coupon code. If they use the coupon code VALUE, that's VALUE, they'll receive a 50% discount. And they'll get one new video from me, essentially a PowerPoint presentation every couple of weeks. And they'll have immediate access to the 75 hours of MacroWatch videos in the archives going back to 2013. So I hope they'll check that out. Excellent, Richard. Well, I, I appreciate the offer for listeners to be able to check out your work at a discounted rate. Richard, thanks so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Tom, I've enjoyed the conversation. Let's do it again sometime. Absolutely. Happy to have you back anytime. Thank you. Thank you. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.